place to do that time. All right. So uh, just kind of review what we talked about on uh, what is today? today's Wednesday. So um, Friday of last week. We got into the imaging system. We talked about the, the identification of the imaging system. We talked about the the, uh, the tabletop or what we had to have in the tabletop. Um, we talked about the principal parts being the, the three principal parts being the the, uh, the x-ray tube, the high voltage generation system, and the console, the console being where we affect the quantity and quality of the, the uh, x-ray tube or x-ray beam. So in quantity, uh, for the most part, what we um, use is uh, KBP, MA, and TIME. And with quality, what we use KBP, uh, as we'll talk about as the semester goes through, there are other things that affect those but uh, for the most part, that's how we affect those. But we also have other things that we control from the control panel, like our focal spot size, our, our uh, photocell selectors, and all those things. We also uh, control there too. So other things that we have to consider, even if we don't manipulate those, would be line voltage compensation, those photocells that we just talked about. Generator type is not gonna be changed from the control panel, a console that's going to be set by the machine type that we utilize. Uh, focal spot selection we do and filtration in as much as we might use compensating filters we can, we can affect the change with that but uh, overall tube filtration we're, we're not going to affect and we'll talk about the different types of filtration when we get to it. So we talked about line voltage compensation and what that is. So in the console we talk about KVP selection. Our KVP selector is our uh, auto transformer. It's rheostat and only uses one um, coil. And it, uh, any kind of transformer has to work off an alternating current. So uh, the, the auto transformer not being any different than any other transformer has to work off of alternating current. And it works off of the transformer law, which means that if the uh, the voltage change is going to be directly respond or directly related to the change in turns ratio between the primary and secondary side. And in that way, uh, if we increase the number of turns on the secondary side, then voltage goes up. If we decrease the, the number of turns on the secondary side, the voltage goes down. So what we're really adjusting whenever we adjust KVP would be those contacts on the secondary side of the auto transformer. So the the turns ratio is variable. We can increase it, we can decrease it, and we detect how much voltage we're actually using with a pre-reading KVP meter. And the reason it's a pre-reading KVP meter is because we don't have KVP yet. We're just using voltage. And since we have a set turns ratio on our high voltage transformer, if our voltage is correct on our auto transformer, we know it's going to be right once it passes through the the high voltage transformer and becomes KVP. So KVP, the names for it were potential difference. Uh, quality is what we use to affect the change in, in beam quality. Electric potential, all of that is KVP. It's adjusted transformer, or the auto transformer, but it's not created until we get to the, um, to the high voltage transformer. And we talked about uh, what changes in the tube pre-exposure, and it's, uh, really at the point of exposure. Pre-exposure, you know, you, you just don't have a whole lot of voltage inside of the, the x-ray tube until you depress the, the exposure button. And at that point, our potential difference between our cathode and anode increases so that we accelerate the electrons across the tube. The higher the KVP, the faster they move until they hit the, the anode and then we get the interactions in the anode. <clears throat> we either create x-rays through brims, we create some through, um, provided our KVP is high enough, photoelectric, uh, but the main thing that we create is heat and a small amount of, of x-rays. So with the increase in KVP, we get an increase in quality, we get an increase in quantity, uh, we have um, <clears throat> the interactions inside of the, the tube increase all the way across the board, we get more of everything, and in the uh, patient, what that amounts to is if we increase KVP, we increase penetration through the patient. So we get a, an increase in the remnant beam. 
So how that affects the image is really minimally, but we have indicators that we have that increase, you know, the actual image of what you see is minimally. Uh, the, the interaction on the image receptor changes significantly, right? So there's a big difference between the two. Um, the image, because the image is, is really a computer image, computer manipulated image, it's not a computer image like AI or anything like that. Uh, your computer processes out overexposure, um, so it really becomes more professional responsibility to select the, the right technique and the right KVP and all that more so than what it does, uh, more so than what it is a, an issue with image flow, right? So it doesn't affect the image all that much. So we talked about KVP and the brim spectrum, and that's really what we just walked through. As we increase KVP, it determines whether or not we have a characteristic spike. It increases the peak energy. It increases the numbers. Remember the, the peak of the bubble here, the top of the bubble represents average energy. It pushes everything towards the high energy side, so we have a higher uh, average energy, high peak, higher peak energy, and it, uh, increase in numbers, and it also gives us a characteristic spike. If we shoot an x-ray beam with a, a peak energy below 69 and a half kVp, we don't have characteristic x-rays, so it determines whether or not we have a characteristic spike, and that's really pretty much where we left off. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, the next couple of slides are really just a re rehashing of that, uh, just kind of a review of, of what we just talked about, so we're really going to kind of skip through those. Um, and we talked about some of this on, on uh, Friday. So what we're going to talk about this semester is effects of KVP on beam quality, which we just did, and we'll, we'll talk about it throughout the semester. On uh, beam quality, uh, the, the effects of, of changing KVP um, uh, on interactions inside of the patient. Those interactions giving us a differential absorption. We'll talk about the effects of KVP on Compton scatter and photoelectric interactions, and I, I kind of messed with his mind a little bit on Friday. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about that more as the, the semester goes on. Uh, patient exposure, the effects of changing KVP on image receptor exposure, how to manipulate KVP to affect a change in patient exposure with and without a change in image receptor exposure. Uh, how to, to manipulate KVP to change image receptor exposure with and well, mainly with patient exposure as well. How to manipulate KVP to reduce patient motion. We tend to focus on MA and time for patient motion, but there is a way to use KVP to, to limit patient motion as well. And sometimes that's fundamentally the only thing that we can do to affect patient motion in some cases. We'll talk about that. How, how changing KVP can change characteristics of the, the image itself, uh, what effect KVP has on occupational exposure, and what other equipment is, is essential whenever we use high KVP. So as KVP goes up, some of the equipment that we use becomes much more important to use. So again, um, just more review of the same stuff. So now what we're going to pick up with is with mass. Do we have any questions on KVP? So KVP, more than any other technical factor, really anything that we can do with the x-ray beam, KVP affects our exposure more than anything else. Be that MA or time or both combined or even distance. You know, we, we stress a, a lot the effects of the inverse square law, but KVP, the effects of KVP, change of KVP is even more significant than the changing of SID. So, um, <clears throat> at the console, mass, we of course have two different things. We've got MA and time, and those are controlled through two different circuits. If you remember from last semester, the, the MA circuit, circuit the, the low uh, amperage circuit, or low voltage circuit, I'm sorry, was a, that lower circuit that we discussed, whereas the timer circuit, if you remember, was between the auto transformer and the step up transformer. It's in the lower voltage circuit. It's uh, in the, the same circuit where we see er almost everything else except for the timers, right? Or except for the, the MA circuit. So it controls the current and the heating of the filament, all right? So we don't have mass until we make an exposure. Remember, at, uh, at the point of exposure, the, the electrons jump across the tube, 
and we have mass. So we have to start counting those photons or those electrons as they jump across the x-ray tube. But uh, we don't have mass until we make an exposure. What we have is MA. So you depress the prep button and the only thing that you're doing is heating that filament. So the more you heat the filament, the more electrons that you collect in your space charge, your electron cloud, before you send them across the tube. So you just have MA, right? So MA is just heating of the filament to get it to the point where we want it to be before the, we send the electrons across to, to make x-rays. So the MA selector is also a type of rheostat. You'll see some questions asked uh, about the KVP re rheostat, and that, of course, would be your auto transformer. But the MA selector is also a rheostat. It increases or decreases the current um, <clears throat> through the select or these precision resistors to give us exactly the amount of current that we want. So it's in a low voltage circuit. It works off a of low voltage, and the reason it works off of, in what I'm talking about in low voltage here is like 25 volts, very, very low voltage compared to even what we're using in the, uh, in the auto transformer. You know, auto transformer may be 440 volts as opposed to in the, the uh, filament circuit, what we're working off of is like 25 volts, not, not 250, 25 volts. And the reason for that is we don't want those electrons jumping, jumping from cathode to anode until we're ready for them to go, right? So we want the voltage to be very low, so it works off of a really low voltage. Um, and then we've got a step-down transformer to make sure that we get down to the voltage that we want. It's, you know, 12 to 15 is what it says here. It's never going to be any, any more than 25 volts. So the MA meter was the one thing that was a little bit confusing. You remember last semester we had questions about, uh, you know, the, the, um, all the voltage or all the, the uh, gauges and controls on the control panel work off a of low voltage, right? All of them work off a of low voltage, that's for safety. Um, so you would think that all of them would be in the low voltage circuit, but remember your MA meter is in the high voltage circuit, but it's wired into the dead center of the, uh, the, the high voltage transformer. And at that point, your voltage is gonna be low all the way down to zero volts. So it still works off low voltage, but it's found in the high voltage circuit as opposed to everything else is found in the low voltage circuit, except for two things. You remember what those two th things were? One is glaringly obvious. What's the last thing the, the voltage has to get to? The tube, right. The tube has to be in high voltage circuit. But there's one other thing. Rectifiers. Rectifiers, bingo. They have to be in the high voltage circuit because all of our transformers have to work off of alternating current. So if we put the, the rectifiers before the high voltage transformer, we don't have high voltage. Right? So they have to be in the high voltage circuit. But you don't control those anyway, right? You don't do anything with those. They're, they're just static. They're there. They're doing their job. Um, so there's, they pose no danger to you. All right? So time selection occurs in that separate circuit. It's in, the, in between the step-up transformer and the auto transformer. Um, and again, mass doesn't exist until we get exposure. So uh, calculation of mass is just MA times time in seconds. And what we often call mass is intensity. And I think I, I shared with y'all, I kind of struggled with that. Um, I wanted to make KVP intensity because it seemed like it was power. But in this context, uh, what we're talking about intensity is just raw numbers. All right, so when you increase your, your MA, let's get with MA before we even talk about time. As you increase your MA, what you're doing is you're sending more electrons through that filament. Again, you don't have tube current yet. You just have filament current. So as you increase your MA, you're directly increasing the number of electrons you're sending through the filament. What does MA stand for? Milliamperage, right. So amperage just being a count of electrons. If you increase your MA, you're increasing the count of electrons. Amperage is just number of electrons, okay? So as you increase your MA, you're just increasing the number of electrons that you're, you're sending through the filament. 
So uh, thinking about a, a light bulb, basically what you're doing is you're making the light bulb brighter. Thinking about your toaster, you just turn the, the temperature up on your toaster. Your oven, you just turned it from 350 to 500 degrees, right? So the, all you're doing is collecting more electrons and you're just making your um, filament hotter. So in the tube, MA and time, uh, you know, they control two aspects, uh, separate aspects of the same thing. MA just controls the heating of that filament, the, the collection of those electrons, that space charge is all that, that MA controls. Once you hit um, your exposure button, right, so you got a two position button, you hit prep, then you activate your MA, but not your timer circuit. Timer circuit doesn't come into play until you depress your exposure button. The electrons travel across the tube until you, you're time, you know, you get to the time that you want, and then it discontinues the, uh, uh, the exposure. So MA controls the heating of the filament, the uh, timer circuit c controls the amount of time that we send electrons across the tube. So uh, thermionic emissions occur during prep. Uh, if you remember from last semester, during exposure, if you have a long exposure, you're still creating thermionic emissions throughout that exposure. It's just that those thermionic emissions are leaving the filament the entire time that you're making those exposures. So mass, overall mass is just number of electrons that travel across the tube in a given time. And that equates to the number of x-rays that we create. Now, if we have a set KVP, there's a direct relationship all the way across the board between the mass that we set and the number of x-rays that we create, right? Where KVP, if we increased our KVP by 15%, we got a drastic increase in the, the number of x-rays that we created, right? To the point that at penetration, point of penetration and uh, interaction on the image receptor, a 15% increase in KVP gave us an increase at the image receptor by a factor of two, right? Okay, so let's switch now back to, to mass. As we increase mass, if we increase mass by 15%, mass now being milli amperage, amperage being a, just a count of electrons, if we increase our mass by 15%, then we increase the number of electrons by 15%. Okay, you follow? So if we increase the number of electrons by 15%, providing our KVP is set, we haven't changed our KVP, if we increase our, our mass by 15%, then naturally what we're gonna do is we're gonna increase the number of photons also by 15%. Where the 15% increase in KVP is drastic, a 15% in mass is uh, almost insignificant, okay? So you'll see questions about technique correction with mass, right? And you'll see rules of thumb. Um, generally speaking, if an x-ray is worth repeating, what you'll hear people say is if it's worth repeating, it's worth doubling the mass, all right? So, you know, your S or your S number, uh, S number is really proprietary, I think it's Fuji. Um, but, um, the, uh, the index number, the exposure index number, should be proportional to uh, how much you overexposed or underexposed the patient. And what I mean by that is that if you make an exposure, and you should have on your exams uh, some sort of indication of what the proper exposure was. So if your proper exposure was 200, right? And let's say your, your index number comes up at 400, then what that means is you either over or underexpose the patient by a factor of two, okay? So one of the few things that actually makes sense, right? right? So it, it means that you either over or underexpose the patient by a factor of two. So some of your systems, some of your index numbers, as the index number increases, that means that uh, you had an increase in exposure. And some of them are exactly the opposite. As the index number increases, that means that you underexpose the patient. There's no uniformity. Um, there should be, there is not. Uh, so you have to know your system. <clears throat> so if, uh, if you're working on a system where increase in, in exposure number 
indicates that you overexpose the patient than if your ideal index number is 200 and you get 400, then you overexpose the patient by factor two. So here's a, your critical thinking question of the day. So your index number indicates that you overexpose the patient by factor two. Your image looks fine. Um, because the computer processed all that extra, you know, density and, and uh, it, it kind of processed it out. Your image looks fine. Radiologists can see what pathologies need to be seen on the image, but it shows that you overexpose the patient by factor two. Do you repeat that exposure? No. Why not? Because you're just exposing the patient. <laughs> you're just blasting the patient again, right? But what if you underexpose the patient the, to the point that, let's, let's say that, that same system, uh, it indicated that you underexpose the patient by factor two, but for whatever reason, you can't really see things very well. What would you do? Repeat it, but what would you do? Increase. Increase your exposure by factor two, right. Okay. So uh, now, Let's take this a step further. Uh, back in the days of screens and films, um, the appearance of the, the image is what determined whether or not you made a, a repeat exposure. If you ex overexpose a patient, you would have to go back in and, and possi possibly have to go back in and repeat an image. If you underexpose a patient, you definitely would, okay? So we make this switch into CR systems that was usually the, the first step because it was an easier transition than CR. We'll talk about that later on. But uh, the computer now made up for some of your, your uh, technical issues, right? And what it did was if, if you fed it too little information, you know, with computers, garbage in equals garbage out, right? So if, if you didn't give it enough information, then it couldn't add information, right? So if you underexpose a patient, it always led to a, to a repeat. But if you overexpose a patient, you gave it too much information, it could get rid of some of that, all right? So the, the tendency was in the early days of CR was to do what do you suppose? Intentionally underexpose a patient and have to repeat? No. Bingo, bingo. <laughs> really, really unethical practice uh, because, you know, people didn't want to have to repeat what they were doing is, is intentionally giving the patient too high of a dose and they wouldn't have to repeat because of technique, okay? That's uh, what you'll hear that referred to as dose creep. Uh, the patient was overdosed on a lot of exposures just, uh, you know, because the computers made people lazy. Um, people, kind of like water, have a tendency to follow a path of least resistance, right? So uh, that's, that was the result, and they actually came up with a word for it. It's called dose creep. Don't do that. All right, so that was kind of a diver diversion, but a, you know, kind of a necessary thing, something that we really kind of need to talk about. So uh, with mass, what we get is a, an increase in the number of electrons that we send from cathode to anode to increase directly in the number of x-rays that we create at the anode, directly changes the number of x-rays we emit from the x-ray tube. So really what that, that results in is a direct relationship all the way across the board, right? So as you increase your KVP, or I'm sorry, as you increase your mass, the, the exact same amount that you change your mass is the exact same amount that you're gonna increase the exposure from the x-ray tube and the exposure to the patient increased by 50%. Your mass goes from, let's say 50 mass to 75 mass. That's an increase in 50%. Then what do you, what's the net result in your x-ray beam? Increased by 50%, right? So there's a direct relationship all the way across the board. KVP was direct, but what's the word? Exponential, right, it was direct and exponential. K, uh, mass, changes of mass are direct all the way across the board, okay? So increased mass techniques increase a couple of different things in addition to that, you know, the, 
current, but also the heat, right? So as we increase our, our mass, what we get an increase in is heat. And what's the main thing that kills x-ray tube? Heat. heat. Heat, right. So what are the ways that it increases heat? Or what, what are, the, what are the, the, the ways that heat can kill the x-ray tube? What's that? Prolonged exposure? Yeah, well, with prolonged exposure, uh, what all do you get? What happens at the filament? It burns out. It burns out, right? Before it burns out, what does it do? It vaporizes and coats the inside of the x-ray tube, and they call that tanning. tanning. Tanning can lead to arcing. Arcing is the number one reason for, you know, sudden tube death. What if it gets to the bearings? Uh, the anode has to spin on something, right? What if it gets to the bearing, bearings and overheats the bearings? It starts to grind and eventually it stops and then you get to a point where you're, you're just gonna melt your anode as well. So uh, what if you put a high heat load, high heat load would be a high mass load on a cold x-ray tube. Crack. crack, yeah, it could potentially crack your anode, right? So all that stuff goes into uh, primarily mass. So even if you do the right things and you use the, the current accepted uh, technical consideration or technical changes for uh, changes in, in patient size, changes in patient thickness, and most pathologies, most of those are going to be changes in mass, then is that going to have an impact on your x-ray tube? The answer is yeah, yeah. Any kind of increase in mass is going to increase that heat and eventually you're going to burn your x-ray tube out. So what I say uh, that I expect to see to be the technical factor of choice change in the future? KVP. KVP, right? Because KVP at the patient, what happens is KVP goes up. We can decrease mass and what happens to patient exposure goes down right also though if we increase kvp we can reduce scatter. no not scatter we'll, we'll get there later uh but in the x-ray tube we're gonna as we increase kvp we reduce mass and we change we decrease mm -hmm. heat right so what happens to the life of the x-ray tube x-ray tube lasts longer, right? So better for the patient, better for the x-ray tube. Fundamentally, the only thing that it's worse for, potentially worse for, is the technologist. Now, how's that? As we increase KVP, what happens to the percentage of PEs versus scatter radiation? Exactly. Percentage-wise, scatter goes up, photoelectric goes down. So what do you suppose your, your occupational dose comes from? Scatter. scatter. Right? Scatter. But are you in the room with a patient, you know, for every chest x-ray? Shouldn't be. Right? Even if you're shooting portable chest x-rays, what do you do? Step out. Step out. Step back as far as you can. Get behind the portable. Put your apron on. All that stuff. Right? So uh, even though you increase your scatter radiation with the uh, increase in, in KVP, it should not affect you all that much, all right? So we talked about most of this, changes in mass directly proportional to, to X-ray emission, uh, equal increase in emission all the way across the board, you increase uh, the, you, you don't change the percentage at all, right? So thinking about the brim spectrum, the only thing that happens is it just increases the numbers. So equal increase in patient exposure and equal increase in image receptor exposure, things go up uh, just proportionally all the way across the board. All right, <clears throat> so um, when we increase mass and decrease time, what do we get? Or increase MA and decrease time, what do we get? Let's say we double our MA and we half our time. What happens? Okay, so how do you calculate mass? Let's say we have 100 MA at one second exposure, what's our mass? Mm 
Huh? He made it with a time. It made times time. Times time. Right. Time in seconds. So what do we have? 100 times 1 is 100, right? So we have 100 mass. So what if we go with 200 MA at half a second? What do we have? 100. 100, right. So um, what we get in that is what we call uh, reciprocity. And we talked about this last semester. What is reciprocity? What, just fundamentally, what does the, the word reciprocity mean? What does a reciprocating saw do? that? It reciprocates, okay? So what does that mean, though? What is what is reciprocal? It gives back when you put it. Bingo. Yeah, it's give and take, right? So reciprocation means that I give you something, you give me something back, right? I ask you a question, you answer it. That's reciprocity, all right? So uh, recipro reciprocation in this case is that, that um, reciprocation, um, reciprocity in this case is that I give up something and you, you know you give up something in, in return so what what we have in reciprocity a law of reciprocity just means mass is mass okay what that means is that 100 ma at one second should be identical to 200 ma at half a second which is identical to 400 ma at a quarter second right mass is mass is mass right so we can affect a a, we can change MA in time to arrive at the same mass value, and sometimes it's beneficial to do so, right? Anybody taking a chest x ray on a kid? Yeah. You want a second long exposure on that? Never, right? Because they just can't be still. Even if they can hold their breath and follow instructions, little kids are just going to move all over the place, right? So we want a, a short exposure time, high MA, short exposure time. Is there a time we want long exposure time? What are we in last semester with? Spine. Spines, right? Lateral T-spine, you can see everything really well on a lateral T-spine, right? <laughs> no, you cannot. It's an awful image, right? So what do we do to increase the visibility? Well, what do we do to increase uh, to, to get rid of some of the anatomy so that we can see the spine better. Remember? Breathing technique. So how do we arrive at a breathing technique? What do you have to have to have a breathing technique? So this is that reciprocity again, okay? <laughs> what do you have to have to have a breathing technique? What do you want with breathing technique? What's that? Longer time, right? With a breathing technique, what you want is longer time because what you're, what you're trying to do is take advantage of motion, right? So the patient breathes throughout the exposure so that you get rid of the lung markings and to a degree the ribs, but you know, you can still see the ribs, just may not be as, as clear as what they were before, okay? So there's a time to increase MA and decrease time. There's a time to, to uh, increase, let's see, I, Increase MA and decrease time. There's time to, to decrease MA and increase time. Um, one possible consequence in making your time too short is uh, it's really not that much of an issue with, with the sensitivity of digital image receptors, but uh, there, there is a possibility if your time gets too short, you could introduce quantum models. Certainly, if your overall mass gets too low, you can introduce quantum model. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Our image receptors now are so sensitive that uh, I've had people try to, try to demonstrate quantum model in our lab. They can't do it. Um, they wound up with mass so low that, you know, is, is almost unregisterable. Still cannot demonstrate quantum model on a digital image receptor. So it's quantum model. Uh, it's still testable. Um, but you're going to be really, really hard pressed. You're probably going to have to do something really wrong in order to introduce quantum model. Okay. So effects on the brain spectrum. The only thing that it does is it changes the numbers. So looking at it, that's just the numbers, right? So we have 200 ma up to 400 ma. Uh, notice the peak doesn't change. The minimum doesn't change. The uh, the 
characteristic spike is just represented by whether or not we have a high enough KVP to get us to a characteristic spike. So we just get an increase in numbers all the way across the board. Nothing changes but numbers. This is why uh, when we used to use screens and films, we wanted to use mass is because if we got to the point where we had adequate penetration, then we didn't want to change the imaging characteristics of the, the x-ray image. So we wanted at that point just to manipulate mass to affect a change in our technique. So it, in those days, if we increased our KVP, we increased penetration, we increased the proportion of scatter and it changed everything about our image. You know, we've got to increase in density because we got to, with the change in KVP, we got to increase in density because we had an increase in tube output, increase in penetration. But also, it made our image look much more gray. But what controls your contrast now? Computer algorithm, right? So, um, <clears throat> I, I really do think this is kind of a holdover from what we used to do. We adjusted mass because it, it made, KVP made such a significant impact on our image. We adjusted mass because we didn't want to change those, those factors. Now those factors, uh, we don't see them. They're not visualized as well. So I, I really do think that eventually clinical practice is going to catch up with the technology and we're going to be adjusting our KVP. It's going to be a little bit more complicated to calculate, uh, but it's, you know, you'll adjust to it. It's, you know, I, I don't think it's going to be as significant as, as what you might think it would be. So we're going to talk about all that stuff uh, this semester on, on regarding mass. So we'll talk about the effects on beam quality, patient exposure, image receptor exposure, image quality, uh, reciprocity, um, effects of, of the, our index number, effect on our index numbers if our values are too high or too low, if our mass values are too high or too low. Okay. Any questions on mass? In voltage rectification, uh, rectification, again, is not something that you're going to deal with most likely uh, at all, but it's still registry testable, so we have to talk about it. So if you happen to go to work in a, a small doctor's office somewhere that they can't really afford uh, modern, more modern equipment or high, higher cost equipment, then uh, with our... Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm not thinking rectification, I'm thinking uh, a generator type. Okay, so scratch that, let's back up. All right, so voltage rectification. Voltage rectification is changing alternating current to, to direct current, right? So we run the, the alternating current through the bank of rectifiers. There's always gonna be at least four rectifiers and it changes our alternating current to direct current. Uh, it occurs in the, the high voltage section, right? Because we have to have alternating current all the way up through the high voltage transformer. Once you get past the, the high voltage transformer, we want it to be direct current so that the, the current goes from cathode to anode, but not from, from cathode to anode, but not from anode to cathode, right? So I passed around last semester, I passed around a, a uh, stationary anode you remember what that looked like completely melted right so uh, if if the the heat that we create and we send across the tube can melt the anode then certainly it could you know melt the the filament itself so we could have a situation where if we got reverse current from the cat from the anode to the cathode would burn out our, our filament pretty quickly right so we have to have it change from alternating to direct current. And that occurs again in the high voltage section past the, the high voltage transformer. And it has to be there because we have to have alternating current to make the, that transformer work. So how does it affect tube output? Well, um, instead of having all the pulses or having the pulses go back and forth across the x-ray tube, it's gonna take all the pulses and have them go in one direction across the x-ray tube. So, it, um, it's going to increase the tube output probably by a factor of two, right? Instead of having half of the, 
the, uh, the electrons at best eliminated, we're going to redirect them and send all of them across the x-ray tube. So it's going to increase, increase the tube output by a factor of two. So the effects on the BRIM spectrum then are, are going to be kind of like an increase in mass. Uh, we're increasing our output by a factor of two. All right? So generator type is where I started to get into earlier. Remember, we have three different types of generators. We have single phase that you're probably never going to see, realistically. Uh, we talked about last semester how you can identify those single phase uh, generators. And there was two things that you could look at the console and you could determine that you're using a single phase generator. One is that's the only generator type where you're going to see the line voltage compensation circuit. Okay, So if you're looking at a, a generator, and most likely it's going to have knobs, it can have buttons, but it might have knobs, and you've got this, um, this little gauge on it, and it says line compensation, Okay, it may not say line voltage, it may just say compensation or line compensation or maybe even just line. You're looking at a single phase generator. The other thing is that if you remember when we talked about timers last semester, we talked about uh, there was a type of timer that we used with single phase equipment. And that was a, um, a synchronous timer. So the synchronous timer worked off of the incoming line voltage, right? So it worked off of the, the, uh, the voltage waveform, right? So if you're looking at a, um, a control panel and the, most of your control panels, when you adjust your time, you're gonna adjust milliseconds, right? But if you happen to see one that adjusts in seconds, those seconds being um, multiples, I'm sorry, fractions, and those fractions being multiples of one one hundred and twentieth of a second, you're working with a single phase machine, all right? So uh, all that to say, you're probably never gonna see those unless you work in a doctor's office somewhere. Um, <clears throat> so what you're gonna be working with most likely are three phase and even more likely you're gonna have high frequency, okay? So what we mean by the voltage ripple is the uh, incoming line voltage oscillates between, you know, it's al alternating current, so it goes in one direction and comes back in the opposite direction. With single phase, regardless of if it's full wave rectified or half wave rectified, you're gonna have 100% voltage ripple. That meaning that uh, X-ray creation is gonna come to a stop with every pulse. With three phase, you have overlapping pulses and it never stops, okay? So what you get with three phase is a higher output over single phase, but you also get a voltage waveform that never drops to zero. So we used the, uh, the analogy last semester, the testing analogy, right? So you have a number of tests and you score zero on one of the tests, what's that gonna do to your average? Okay. It's gonna drop your average, but if I throw away that zero, you know, I'll toss the, the lowest test score, and that test score being a zero, what's that gonna to do to your average? It's gonna increase it, right. So same thing here, with three phase generators, since our voltage waveform never drops to zero, we're gonna get a higher average. All right, so we'll take a look at that on the um, voltage waveform as well, or on the brim spectrum. So uh, the voltage ripple for single phase was 100%, regardless what type of, of single phase it was. For three phases, 14%. For high frequency, it's going to be 1% uh, or less. So the most common that we use now is the high frequency. Uh, you're probably gonna have uh, a hard time finding even a three phase 12 pulse in a hospital. Remember in, the, in three phase, we've got two different types. We've got three phase uh, six pulse, we've got three phase 12 pulse. Three phase 12 pulse, 3% voltage ripple. High frequency is gonna be less than 1%. Almost a constant voltage waveform. Okay? So what happens voltage waveform as we change generator types? Uh, it becomes more um, constant, more constant, which has near constant potential that would be your high frequency. Uh, the average Tube output increases, 
um, the uh, the numbers increase, the effects of the on the height of the broom spectrum it increases, the effects on the average it pushes it towards a high energy side. Right now, this this is again one of those things that just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You have single phase and you have three phase, and we talked about this last semester. Of you would think that the change in output from a single phase to three phase because you got one to three right you would think that the change would be a factor of three but it isn't remember as you change from single phase to three phase it's a factor of two right yeah okay so um, this is what it looks like so again what we get as we change machine phase is we get an increase in in the the height of the bubble, so we get an increase in numbers. Remember, everything under the bubble just reflects the number of x-rays that we create. So we get an increase in the number of x-rays we create from single phase, three phase, three phase to high frequency. Uh, with each step, it goes up. But notice that from three phase to high frequency, it's not that, not that much, right? But from single phase to three phase, it's pretty significant. But that's um, not the only thing that it changes. Again, the peak of the bubble represents the average energy, so it pushes it towards a high energy side. So, you know, this being high energy, high KVP. So it pushes it towards a high energy side. So it increases the average, increases the number of x-rays it will create, right? No effect on peak, no effect on characteristic, no effect on minimum, increases the height, increases the, uh, the average, okay? Any questions on that? And just uh, kind of review of that. Well, I have about five minutes left, so one would pull up there um, instead of getting into this next section, which has a few things we've got to talk about. Any questions on any of that?